Um, Deanne Bell uh, has a background in mechanical engineering. She's also been the host of several shows on TV, including uh, Smash Lab on Discovery Channel. But she's going to be talking to us today about a new K-12 program that the American Society of Mechanical Engineers has called uh, Future Engineers. Um, and she'll say a little more about herself once she gets set up. Yeah. All right. So, um, as I said, my name is Deanne Bell. I am a mechanical engineer. I'm also a television host. Uh, I've hosted a variety of shows about science, engineering, and construction on networks ranging from PBS to Discovery Channel to ESPN. Um, and most recently, last year, I started an education program called Future Engineers. It's an online platform that hosts challenges for students. Um, our first challenge launched in September last year. It was a, a national challenge for K-12 students here in the United States to uh, design a tool for astronauts to 3D print in space. And um, it launched the same day that the, the, zero, the zero gravity printer launched to space that you just saw images of right there. And the, the name Future Engineers, I want to talk about this first, because um, I was so excited. FutureEngineers.org was available to buy, and I was like, woohoo, we're doing this. And um, I remember my mom telling me, uh, just asking, like, do you think that that's a little too exclusive? Do you think you might turn off some students by just, you know, appealing to only engineering? And I said, you know what, in the short term, you might be right. But I really have a passion and a vision and a love for this word. And there's a reason I named the program Future Engineers. And it's because I think engineering is awesome. <laughs> I am so incredibly proud to be an engineer. And no matter how my career has evolved and transformed and taken me in all these different directions, I know that that background of being an engineer has given me the tools to do anything that I want to do in this world. And I am so passionate about this term that I'm excited to envision a world where we actually use this term in everyday conversation differently than we do now. And what do I mean by that? Well, right now I feel like sometimes the word engineer is a little intimidating. You feel like you can only engineer something if you are actually uh, a person that has a degree in engineering. But I envision a world where a, f a five year old can say, I engineered something new. Or a 105 year old can say, I want to engineer a new solution, whether they have that degree or not. Much like I can say, I nursed someone back to health, even if I'm not a certified nurse. Or I can say, I painted a picture, if I'm not a professional painter, right? So I, I'm excited to get this term in our everyday vocabulary. Not that people aren't using it now, but I want them to use it more because it's awesome. And so I want to talk about what, what's going on now. Like a lot of people say things about engineering, but they might not use the term. For example, MacGyver. The little ones, I know you don't know this show, but this show was in the 80s. There was a guy that used to engineer things all the time using a paper clip and a rubber band. And you, see, you hear people say all the time, oh, I just MacGyvered something together. Oh, we've, we've taken a person and made it into a verb. And I really think that he was engineering. And in our education communities, we have all these amazing, awesome trends in education, which I think really embody um, engineering. And, and um, they've taken off like wildfire. I love all of these trends, one of which is the maker movement. I think it's fantastic, inspiring students to just make, whether they're using knitting needles or whether they're using a 3D printer, just to make and to create new things. EdTech. Encouraging students to be literate in technology and teachers and to integrate technology in their classrooms. Awesome, love it, totally in line with engineering education. Inventing, there's inventing camps popping up all over the place. Love it, when I was young, all I wanted to be was an inventor. Completely in line with engineering education for K-12 students. Design thinking, encouraging students to really understand a problem and to refine and refine and refine until they get to that solution. Awesome, completely in line with engineering. Tinkering, there's tinkering schools and hacking schools popping up all over the place. Love it, so totally in line with engineering. And my goal is to, to encourage students to know that all of those terms have a path forward with a degree in engineering. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a little girl. That little girl is me. Um, I grew up and, uh, in, in Palm Bay, Florida. And I love to invent. I love to tinker. I love to problem solve. I didn't have money, so I would go to thrift stores and I would buy uh, broken down stuff and I would take it apart and I'd use those motors to make my crazy whimsical machines in my backyard. I actually, in eighth grade, told my parents that I wanted to put a bandsaw on my wedding registry when I got older. I was just obsessed with wanting to make stuff. And I was a perfect candidate for the maker movement, even though we weren't makers back then. 
But when I got into high school, um, I didn't really know what engineers actually did for a living. And, um, and, and I got told this all the time. You're really good at math and science. You should be an engineer. And I was like, OK. Um, you know, I like other things, too. It's not like I was illiterate. It's not like I couldn't put two feet in front of the other and, and play sports. So why, if I was good at something, should I just do that? And the truth is, I didn't choose to get an engineering degree because I was just good at something. It's because I ultimately wanted to use my creativity to turn my ideas into a reality. And the beauty of an engineering degree for me was that, yeah, you had to learn math and science and get the tools. But then when I got out, I could apply that to whatever I wanted. If I liked music, I could make a musical instrument or design music editing software. If I liked sports, I could make sports equipment or design prosthetics to help people play sports. Or if I uh, wanted to work on Capitol Hill and I liked government, I could lobby for green technologies. I could work on policy with NASA. Uh, there are so many things that I could do with that background in that degree. And so it's my mission to make sure that students out there that like design and they like making, and they like inventing, they like tinkering, or adults that like MacGyvering, um, that they know that all of these all are amazing qualities of what an engineer actually does for a living. And that we have the capacity to use our creativity to not only hatch an idea on a napkin, but to ask the right questions, to find the right answers, and to ultimately turn our ideas into a reality. So let's talk about that a little bit. Talking about turning our dreams into a reality. There's been two milestones in my life that have really kind of put me on the path of where I am today. One of which is becoming a television host. And it's a pretty crazy story. So when I was younger, my parents always told me to imagine the impossible. If you can dream it, you can make it happen. And it was usually in terms of technology. And so I always grew up with this notion of imagining the impossible. And I was traveling the world. I had worked as an aerospace engineer, saved my pennies, and I decided to go backpacking. And I, I just went solo. I grabbed a backpack, and I went and traveled around the world. Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Tibet, China, the Philippines. And the Philippines was an interesting place, because I was at a hostel. I hadn't surfed the web in months. And I thought, you know what, I should start sending out resumes. And I went to a, a hostile computer station, and I looked at job boards. And one of the first things that popped up was looking for an engineer to host a television show on PBS. And I thought, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? This is my Imagine the Impossible. This whole time I've been traveling, that's when I kind of had this idea that I wanted to do, but I just didn't think I was really suited for it. But that's my Imagine the Impossible. And I sent in my information, and they said, you look great, but our last audition is in two days in Boston. And I said, oh, wait, wait, I'm in the Philippines. Can you wait? And they said, let us know if you can make it, period. And I had a glass of wine with a German pig farmer that night. And he said, you know what? I think you should go. And I said, you know what? I think you're right. And I changed my ticket somehow for like 50 bucks. I got on a plane the next day. I flew all the way to Boston. I auditioned at 9 PM. I, uh, I, I got there at 9 PM. I auditioned at 9 AM. And I got the job. I imagined the impossible, and I ended up becoming a television host. And I've had the honor of hosting shows on a variety of different networks. It's been a really, really fun experience. But um, I'm going to get some water. Hold on. But over that journey, I, I really have started to understand the power of media. It is such an influential force in our society. And I really think that we have an obligation to use media for the power of good. And those of us that work in media, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're doing everything we can to use that high quality media to inspire the next generation um, of, of, of thinkers, of innovators, of explorers. And I think that there's, it's interesting. There's all this, you know, there's data and analytics everywhere for everything from stock markets to political campaigns to knowing how many times I Google cats, right? But there's not a metric, that, it's not as easy to quantify a metric for inspiration, right? So when you think about it, when I think about my parents' generation, do we know how many of them became an engineer because they saw the first man that walked on the moon? Do we know how many people in this room might become a scientist because they had the honor of being at Microsoft headquarters and just feeling like a guest of honor here? Um, do, we, do we know how many people might go into science or engineering because they saw a role model of a woman on TV that really, really thought engineering was awesome? <laughs> So, so this inspiration is something that I'm really passionate about. And it, and, and it goes beyond just data and analytics. And uh, so because of that, I decided last year to create an education platform called Future Engineers. And I had this idea. 
And once again, I was like, how do I turn this idea into a reality? And I actually, I don't work at NASA. I contacted NASA and I said, you guys are sending a 3D printer to space. And I really, really, really want to create an outreach program so we can get students designing and inventing and developing things for space. And they said, awesome. Gave me a bear hug and they said, let's do this, let's do this. And um, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers got on board and our first challenge launched last September, as I, as I mentioned before. We challenged students across the country to design a tool for astronauts to use and to 3D print in space. Now, the first challenge, uh, was it's been fantastic. It launched the exact same day that the printer went to space. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about this printer. So the printer uh, launched to space on September 21st last year. It's the first zero gravity 3D printer that's ever gone into space. Uh, why is that so exciting? It's so exciting because it's the first step in this whole world of in-space manufacturing. And when we talk to our younger generations about going to Mars, it's so exciting to use space to inspire them to think about what happens when something breaks and you're on Mars. What do you do? And, and how can we use 3D printing and manufacturing to build not only the parts and the spare tools that we need, but the habitats using Martian soil? Or what about if we're limited on the, the materials that can we, we can bring? Um, you know, NASA's working on all these recycler programs that can take old parts and put them back into new parts. And it's so inspiring to, to tell this to students and to let them think and dream. And so we had all of these great submissions. Um, we had. Um, Students that created a hand, a hand trash smasher that compacts trash and you get your exercise while you do it. We had another young kid that designed a water catcher um, that's basically a fly swatter that can, you can use to collect all that water that's roaming around the space station and it sticks in the voids of the fly swatter. Um, our winning design was designed by a guy named Robert. I have it here in our teen division, the MPMT. He took a ton of different tools and put it into a 3D printed form. And I have the honor of saying that this is going to be the first ever student designed 3D print in history. So this printer was designed by a company called Made in Space out in Silicon Valley uh, for, for NASA. It's gone up. Uh, they've been printing successfully. All the uh, samples are coming back down now and they're analyzing them. Um, the, the excitement for me is, is extending the reach of this printing initiative with Mars, with students. And our program really opts to incentivize. We, you know, we don't just throw money at, at kids. That's not effective in my mind. It's about STEM experiences. How do we reward these kids with cool, awesome science experiences? So for example, the grand prize is a student gets their print up in space. The runners up get to fly out to Los Angeles and they get a day at a visual effects company in Hollywood where they see how 3D models are used to make movies. They get a day at SpaceX where they're a VIP and they get to see how 3D models are used to make rockets. The finalists all got to be interviewed by a judging panel, including two astronauts. They got to present their inventions and their ideas to astronauts and get their feedback from living in space. As well, our platform um, is all about 3D modeling. Right now, we're all about getting students uh, digitally literate and fluent with making 3D models. We know that a lot of students might not have made a 3D model before. So how do we use media to explain these basic concepts of how to make 3D models? So once again, uh, we, we've, since it's an online platform, we've created cool media content that's quick and snappy and relatable uh, for people to buzz onto our website, see it, learn, and go out and invent and create. So here's an example of how we taught 3D modeling concepts, a little short snippet. Starring me. I'm free labor, so everything starts me. <laughs> All right, so that one goes on to, divide, to define the terms of 3D modeling visually for students to understand the design methodology before they go to their computers and they start inventing and building and creating their 3D modeled inventions. Also, we've created science lessons that are two minutes or less which is really exciting. Uh, we worked with a partner called Funky Animations to explain concepts that are uh, as complicated as microgravity in ways that are relatable to students. I'm not gonna play a whole lesson, but I'll play a snippet from one of our lessons. Hi, 
There are loads of things orbiting Earth. Broadcast satellites, weather satellites, communication satellites, GPS satellites, international space stations. Yeah, it's busy up there. You'd think there would be a space traffic jam. Why doesn't that happen? Well, because they're miles apart. There are three main rings of orbit around Earth. Low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and geosynchronous orbit. All current manned spaceflight is in the first one. The ISS, for example, is around 220 miles away from Earth and makes one full orbit in just 90 minutes. The astronauts see 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Awesome! They like awesome as much as I do, evidently. <laughs> Um, and last, I'm going to show you a video that we launched to, uh, we used to launch our first challenge. Um, so I worked with a production company out in Los Angeles. Uh, I begged and pleaded them to, to donate a lot of their time to create um, some really high power media to help us promote our first challenge and the, the launch of the whole program. And I'm going to show you this video now. If I can get it started. We are always told to look forward, plan for the future, shoot for the stars. What about today? What about now? Our parents always tell us to never stop dreaming. But how do we get anything done if we are always dreaming? Instead, we need to be doing. Sure, think big, but then actually do it. Push yourself. Push yourself beyond what you thought was feasible. In conclusion, I'll leave you with this. Uh, if you're not a student, I encourage you to join our mission to inspire the next generation of thinkers, to make our future a little bit brighter. And if you are a student, I encourage you to participate in our next challenge. It launches April 29th. It's another 3D design challenge uh, in partnership with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Foundation and NASA. And I can't tell you what it is, but it's going to run all summer. So you have time to learn the tools that you guys need um, to make your inventions uh, for space. So that's it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. If you're a tweeter, tweet us. <laughs> Thanks. Yay. Any questions for Deanne? One in the back here. Hi, Deanna. Hi. Deanna, you said that uh, media has a responsibility yeah. for, for everyone, yeah. but it's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because media is, is pushed by big money and politics, and uh, you know, it's always slanted, you know, depending on which channel you watch. You know, I mean, we try to get and, and, and take information from media, but so many times it's, it's so skewed. You know, it's, uh, it makes you apprehensive about taking verbatim what they say, you know, because it's, it's always in one direction, either left or right, let me put it that way, you know. So it's, it's kind of hard to, 
you know, take it as a, uh, as a, as a source. Okay. You know. Is there a question? Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> more a statement. Listen. It's more a statement, and I'm, ask, I'm asking you for a, a yeah, rebuttal, for my you feedback. know. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, I, so I think what you're saying is uh, it, it's awesome to hear your opinion and, and thoughts. Um, I, I agree that, you know, media, anything, any industry you're in needs to make money, and, and, and that's, you know, how it goes. But the truth is, is that, you know, when... For example, I have friends that have little girls and they, they you know, are brought up and they're like, no, I'm, they're always going to play with the gender neutral toys and they're going to do this. And at the end of the day, the girls run in and say, I really want this because I saw it on TV or my friends really like it. And the truth is, I think we need to acknowledge that, this, that media has a power in our society and, and how can we leverage those brands and those things with STEM programs? You know, to take that and to build on it and to use it to inspire. Um, so for me, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I understand that. Um, I think what you're saying is more in the context of television. But now, you know, with web media and everything, we have the power to to, to create media in all different kinds of forms and to leverage partnerships and and to um, use strong brands to to positively impact and educate students. And so for me, that's just my philosophy that I think that um, you know. I'm always going to be working on television shows of different forms, um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm proud and excited to leverage those networks and those connections uh, that I have to also make programs that impact our younger generations. Good answer. Any other questions? Uh, I've got one, actually. Yeah. So um, it, it's a sort of at the post-inspiration level, we know that the uh, attrition rates from uh, not just engineering, but the physical, biological sciences, more so in mathematically related fields in undergraduate, is extremely high, right? So we have more than two thirds, almost three quarters of people who are entering with an expressed interest in these degrees, um, dropping out or not finishing, not completing right. degrees in this field, and it's a higher rate for women and so forth. Do you think that there's, um, I don't want to say a responsibility, it's not the thing, but how do you address the issue of, what do you think about anyway, the issue of inspiring a lot more people to enter you know, into a, a discipline initially that we're that we don't have the infrastructure yet in place, at, you know, pedagogically to keep them from dropping out of. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I know. Funneling what you're saying. more people in. So just I, I actually speak at, at universities and colleges um, more often. So um, you know, I don't speak about that necessarily in this in this talk. Um, but for me, I, I was a, a student in that same situation. I went to engineering school. About my third year, I had a crisis where I was like, I don't know if this is for me. Um, it happened to me. <laughs> yeah, and I'd say most people have a similar story. And I almost left and totally abandoned it and did something else. And I had a really strong mentor that was like, Deanne, are you crazy? Like, all these, things, all these things that you are learning can be applied to so many different things. And when you get out into industry, you are going to thrive. All these extra personal skills that you have, um, your passion for all these different things are going to be the inspirations that you use for applying your engineering degree. Um, and, and for me, I think that we need to really communicate to students uh, uh, that are at universities that the tools that they are learning um, are tools right now. And that ultimately, they, um, and, and just keep reminding them of all these different applications they can use those tools for when they get out. Because it's hard sometimes when you're in college and you're doing your problem set after problem set after problem set to realize, what am I going to do with this? And when you're doing problem sets, there's only one right answer, usually. you know, And you have a sign error, and you're like, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, but for me, it, it's, it's when you get out in the industry, there's not just one right answer. There's a million right answers. And I think we need to make sure that students that are in school understand that, that, that to see the light at the end of the tunnel, that they're learning tools that they can apply in so many ways when they get out. That's my thought, cool. at least. <laughs> OK, thanks. Let's thank the end.